January 1939, Hitler made his horrific prophecy speech to the Reichstag. On the 30th of January, he prophesied that the coming war would see not the rise of Bolshevism, which he described as the victory of Jewry, but the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. He used those words. I was slightly surprised when I was at the Reform Conference the other day to hear Bishop Wallace Benn, Bishop of Lewis and a man of great integrity, say that the Church of England was now facing its own January 1939 moment. Listen for yourself. I am about to use an analogy and I use it quite deliberately and carefully um, and it slightly frightens me to use it but I do think it's where we're at. I feel very much increasingly that we're in January of 1939. We're in, and what we mustn't do is create a phony war. But we need to be aware that, that there, are, there is real serious warfare just around the corner. It's actually arrived in, in, in some ways already. And we're in, we're in a challenging and a, and a serious situation. Um, and uh, over, over several issues we may find, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've only two years left before retirement, but the Church of England into which I was ordained is not the same church today. Um, and some decisions it may well make over the next five years are going to, to marginalise um, uh, some of us and, and push us either to the very edge or out of the church. And that's a very serious issue. If, if you feel in your parishes, if, and if your folk wake up to this, they'll wake up pretty quick, and you should help them to wake up if they haven't woke up already. If they understand that the, the rector they like and the curates they love, sorry, I like and love, I, I, I use them interchangeably. <laughs> they may love the rector and like the curate. Um, love and like, but, but if they suddenly realize that the, the ministry that's caused by God's, under God's grace, that church to grow that they love, they may not get in another generation. You see, there are, there are some younger, of our younger uh, guys at theological colleges will not be able to take the oath of canonical obedience if no proper provision is made uh, when women bishops into the Church of England, uh, which is, is about taking an oath of, of obedience to the bishop, your heirs and successors. Mm. I mean, that's a very, it's a very serious issue, and it's a legal issue, which there has to be a legal answer to. That's why a code of practice is just not adequate. Um, but the St. Augustine Society has, um, uh, it, it, to belong to, uh, uh, we, we need to be careful when we talk about it, mission agency. It's not like the old missionary society, CMS and BCMS and no crosslinks and so on and so on. Um, but actually a society of um, um, a mission presbyters for England, which is lay membership and church membership but is committed to mission but is, is, a, is a way of um, gospel and Bible people networking, standing together, supporting one another and having what I've called a kind of silver and gold membership. Yes, and sometimes when you say to some of our church folk, well, you know, this is not an issue here for us and we're quite happy with the relationship, well, thank God for that. But actually over the border in the neighboring diocese, there may be people pulling their hair out. Um, some of us can't afford to do that. No, <laughs> some of us don't have too much left to pull out. Um, uh, but things happen very slowly in the Church of England, don't they? Um, one senior leader said to me uh, not long ago, Paul, you've got to remember that the default position of the Church of England in good times is inertia. In difficult times, it's total paralysis. <laughs> and we're in difficult times. Yeah. And uh, Th that, that's just, I mean, to be fair to us, sometimes that slowness has been a good thing, hasn't it? Not to be pushed around by the kind of wind of change. And sometimes to avoid and, confrontation. And, and sometimes not to avoid confrontation on secondary issues. But that's not where we are now. We have major confrontation on first
first order gospel related issues and an inability to grasp hold of the nettles and deal with them. And you know, that becomes damaging to the church. Yeah, you know, most of us here will know, probably all of us will know, that, that when the New Testament uses, when Paul uses the word sound doctrine, <coughs> it's healthy doctrine. Because when the church moves away from apostolic faith and apostolic commitment, it becomes unhealthy. Uh, it, uh, the, the, the literal meaning of the word is as joints dislocated, and that's what we're seeing. And, you know, when um, uh, those of us who want to stand by the gospel and the Bible are accused of dividing the church or being troublemakers, it's actually those who are introducing novelty into the church that are the, trouble, the troublemakers. The people who want to move away from apostolic faith and life, truth and lifestyle that the apostles model for us, foundation of the church. They're the ones who are dislocating the church and if we don't deal with it, the whole church suffers as a result. <coughs> we'll give you an answer that it's really an old boys network. It's all about social connections. But it's actually, it's always been at our best. It's always been. We're a confessional church. It's always about what you believe. And it isn't about an old boys network. You see, what's happening, I think, in the Anglican Communion is the same thing that happened in the Commonwealth um, a little while ago. People are saying, we want to belong to the Commonwealth, but we don't want the British Prime Minister always to be the chairman and always tell us what to do or stop us from doing what we know is the right thing to do. And so, you know, as the, as the, the global church the, uh, has become, uh, in the two-thirds world, the global south, uh, generally speaking, two-thirds world, has become stronger and found its voice, it's not prepared to be pushed around anymore by a liberal Western church. And thank God they're not. It's, it's, it's very healthy. And so we're seeing a whole shift, really, in terms of power and influence from the West to the, uh, the new world, so, so to speak. And, you know, that's a good thing. Now, if that legislation is going to succeed and get through, there needs to be better provision. And the question is, how can we, how can we make that better provision, given that so many different um, possibilities have been discarded, either by the revision committee or by synod? And this idea for a society is a new one that wasn't fully explored, either by synod or the revision committee. And the idea behind it is that um, the Church of England is well used to religious societies operating with their own Episcopal visitors. And the suggestion is that if we can form a society that uh, parish churches could belong to, uh, they would then have the oversight of the bishops of that society. Um, the Bible insists on the absolute equality of status of both men and women, but it describes different roles to them, just as within the Godhead there are different roles for the Father and the Son. Another Church of England traditionalist, Father Ed Tomlinson, illustrated one of his blogs on the issue of women bishops with this photograph. This shows all of Germany listening to the Führer's speech at the memorable Reichstag meetings on January the 30th, 1937. The National Socialist Press published these photographs after speeches by prominent party leaders to reinforce the idea that ordinary people felt solidarity with the regime. Father Ed removed it from his blog after it was picked up by Hugh Muir in his Guardian diary. So, the Church of England is at war. I think there's no doubt about that. But was Bishop Wallace Benn really thinking in terms of the women bishops as Hitler and the traditionalists and conservative evangelicals, his own party, as the victims, as the equivalent to the Jewish people. I phoned him today to ask, and he clarified. He said he was thinking of Churchill and not Hitler. But Bishop Wallace said, I was thinking in Churchillian terms of the storm clouds being on the horizon. People in January 1939 knew there was war coming. They knew there were some big issues, that unless something amazing happened, there would be catastrophe. I was thinking in Churchillian terms and not of Hitler at all, except in the sense that Hitler was the problem. Just, I assume, like women bishops.